So my name is Mike Pavic. Uh, I, I was in the Army for 22 years. I did uh, 10 years of logistics. Uh, and then the remainder of that time was done doing modeling and simulation development uh, for the Army. Uh, I retired in 2018. And Eagle Group was a huge part of my transition because honestly, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I grew up. And it was kind of time for me to start growing up. I'm, I'm still not there yet, though. Uh, um, so, so after I landed a job at MTS as a, a product manager for a number of different test systems, I came back and volunteered to help with uh, um, Eagle Group. And so that's where we are now. And so the topic for today is uh, DOD interviewing. And the reason that I volunteered uh, <laughs> was because I actually have uh, been involved in a about five or six different uh, hiring actions in my final four years in the army. So I did kind of learn the, learn the process as well as what I uh, created several different job positions. Um, so I was a hiring manager. Uh, so, so essentially, and I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and let me know if it works okay. And you should be seeing, oops, let's switch over to this. You should be seeing this set of slides, uh, not, not the speaker notes. Yes. Okay. Got it. Great. Um, and, and so the biggest thing about DOD interviews is it, is it is the federal system. So what we're going to talk about today is kind of how the uh, interview process goes, uh, how it is a structured interview, what are the things that the interview panel are looking for. And let me go to the next slide. So we're going to talk the overall flow and where does the interview fit into that process. Uh, we're going to talk about the different styles of interviewing uh, that, that you'll see, uh, but really we're going to key in on that one that's called uh, the structured interview. We'll kind of break that down into a little bit more detail. And then we'll talk about how interviewees or candidates are rated as well as then we're gonna go through a job description and take a look at what we've learned in terms of ratings and all, all these other pieces, and then see what we can pull out of a, a job description that is still live on USA Jobs. And then we'll close it out with uh, some tips and, and, and then questions. All right, so this shows the overall process that you're going to see with any government uh, position. On the left side are the major uh, steps and then on the right side or afterwards are all kind of the sub uh, phases or uh, sub steps of those major phases. So, so you see the in identify job and assessments. So that's when you're creating a job. So most of this stuff won't apply if, if you're a candidate um, or it will be, a, I should say, will be invisible to you as a candidate. Um, the next part is that announced recruiting and announcing. That's when you see it come out uh, on USA Jobs. The next major phase is accept and review applications. Uh, that's after the people have applied and then they start going through the screening uh, of the various applicants. The next step is assessing the applicants. And that's what we're gonna talk about today it is particularly the interview portion of the assessment of the applicants. And then lastly, you're gonna, uh, there's the certifying the eligibles. So after a candidate is selected, uh, for the job, then the whole process of kind of closing the deal, including uh, the final audit. Uh, so, so one thing that's kind of unique about federal hiring and military hiring in, in general is legal defensibility is a huge, huge deal. And we're going to talk about that in, in just a little bit. But you can see it's kind of a, a long process that goes on. This is why government jobs don't um, uh, go super, super fast for, through that hiring process, even though it seems like that window sometimes is only open for a short period of time. And, and, and so throughout this time, if you have any questions, just jump in, uh, go ahead and speak up. Um, you can throw them in the chat, but it's honestly just easier, easiest just to start speaking up. So, so any questions so far? Okay. So structured, so there's two basic types of interviews that you can do. You can do an unstructured interview or a structured interview. Generally, you're gonna see, especially within the DO, Department of Defense, structured interviews. And so what is a structured interview? Okay, so what it is, is all candidates, here's some characteristics. All candidates are asked the same question in the same order. So when we used to do this, a structured interview is a very, very coordinated interview process versus an unstructured, which is a lot more free flowing. Um, an unstructured interview will have different questions for different candidates. And so there's, there's some challenges with that. So, so what you see in a government hiring a lot are, are these types of interviews. 
Um, so one thing, all candidates are asked the same question in the same order. And what we would do is with our interview panel, we'd in fact have the same person asking the same question in the same order. So we would say Pavic's question number one, Bob is question number two, Jim is question number three. And throughout all the interviews we would do, we would do that exact same order as much as possible. Sometimes you get situations where the interviewer interviewing panel has to change around a little bit, uh, but for the most part, you try to stick with it, with this. Um, all candidates are evaluated using a common rating scale. So we're gonna talk about this more, but pretty much it's kind of like a rubric of um, your ans of the questions and answers and, and how the interview panel will evaluate those answers. Um, and then, well, I guess I kind of just gave the, talked about the third one, interviewers are in agreement on acceptable answers. So, so for the interview panel, you'll do several sessions where you're developing the, the questions, you're developing what the answers should be, um, you're developing how you're gonna rate the scale and scale the candidates before going into the interview. Uh, so whenever I would run a panel, you would have at least three or four meetings because you'd also have to do where you screen the candidates. Um, and then that was another step. But you, so you're screening candidates, you're building the interview questions, you're building uh, the rubric, you're even doing the, the reference questions for after, after the interview. So what are the benefits of this? Because it seems kind of lockstep in terms of in the interview process, and it is. Um, and, and there's reasons for that. One of the benefits is high reliability as defined by rating consistency amongst, among interviewers. Okay, the next is validity, which is just says, and I'm, I know I'm reading the slides, the extent to which the assessment method measures what is intended to measure. So things like job performance, how well does those do those questions and those rating skills measure the competency or, or, or uh, KSA that the interview panel is trying to get out of. Um, and then lastly is legal defensibility. So, so especially in the, in the government uh, hiring, legal defensibility is a big, big deal too, um, because you can get candidates that protest the result and then it, it delays the whole process and some, in some cases invalidates the whole process. And that's the risk, for, that's probably the biggest risk with an unstructured interview where you're asking different questions to different candidates. Uh, because it introduces a whole bunch of potential bias in there. Uh, so defensibility is a big deal. And that's why you see just a lot of conservative um, nature in, in the hiring process for the, for the government. Any questions? Does that kind of clear what a structured interview kind of format might look like? Okay. All right. So here's how the interview is generally set up. So you're gonna have an interview panel Normally it's between about two to four members, which includes the hiring managers. Um, when I would do it, I'd always try to keep actually generally an odd number of, of uh, interview uh, panel members. That way, as we had our discussion, we wouldn't get locked into ties um, or theoretically wouldn't get locked into ties. Um, next, is, so, so at the panel itself. So what you're looking for in the panel is you're looking for people who are kind of subject matter experts in that particular area. Um, if we're doing, say, for a program analyst uh, for, well, we're going to talk about a program analyst for the Mission Command Center. Um, so that might be somebody who has a background in, in C, oh, I'm throwing out too many acronyms. I'm sorry, who has a background in uh, uh, IT, for example. Um, it might be a person who's managed a large number of, of programs. Um, you're also looking for somebody who kind of understands the current needs and the current environment that 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 position is gonna be filling. Uh, you're looking for both internal and external to the organization. Uh, one of the things that you're always trying to avoid is this group think. Uh, for example, if it's all of us from the same organization and General Smith has, has this as their top priorities, all we might be thinking during that interview panel is the top priorities of the current general at that time. It, it, and that can become real short-sighted and that, that might not get us uh, what we need. And we might be thinking about the bigger picture. So you want people from both inside the organization and outside the organization to help kind of give that balanced uh, view. The other part of balance is diversity. So as much as possible, you're trying to uh, include diversity within the interview panel. Some uh, examples are race, gender, even a service member or not, you know, a service member. So, so funny story, when I was running one of the panels, uh, I had one person from external to our organization, uh, uh, she and I, is that right? She and I, we, 
anyways, we had worked together and I told my boss, okay, boss, I've got this person from inside the organization, I'll be there. And then this person from outside the organization. My boss was like, great, now all you need is a minority and you'll be good to go. And I looked at him and I'm like, hey, hey boss, you know, I'm, I'm Asian. And he goes, no, you're a service member. And I'm like, yes, true, but I'm also Asian. And he goes, no, you're a service member. I have to talk to HR to make sure that you're a minority. And about a couple hours later, he came back. He goes, Mike, good news, you're a minority. So, so, so we we hit all the all the diversity blocks there. So, yay. <laughs> so, as far as the interview format itself, and we kind of talked about this. Oh, actually, we didn't talk about this. So, there's two types of questions that they can you can kind of categorize interview questions in generally. Um, behavioral event interviews, and that's uh, where you talk about past. Uh, behaviors. So tell me a time when. Um, the other one is situational interviews. These are hypothetical future situations. These are the ones where you say, so you walk into a room with an angry customer who wants his money back, what do you do? Um, and, and you can kind of do kind of a combination uh, of both. Um, the bottom line is in terms of the format, you really want it to highlight those competencies that you're looking for within from the job. And you're gonna see that in the job conducted during the job analysis. And as a candidate, you're gonna see that in the job uh, description itself. The other one that's to, uh, not listed there is also a lot of knowledge-based questions. Uh, tell, tell me about uh, what are the five combat training centers in, in, the, in the army um, and, and what are their main focuses, for example. The last part of this that we kind of, I alluded to just a second ago was the quality ranking factor. So, so one of the things that's important is you have your screening criteria or your screening uh, factors, and then you have your quality factors. And the quality factors are the ones that you're actually evaluating the candidates on. The screening ones are just the ones that either you accept the candidate or, or you reject them. The quality ones are what you're gonna be evaluating on. Uh, so it's defined as a competency or KSA that significantly enhances performance. Um, and then there's the, the screening criteria or the selective factors. Any questions uh, on kind of that setup? What, can you re-explain that KSA is different than a selective factor? Can you give examples? Yep, so, so a selective factor might be um, must have, and these are kind of the base requirements that you see in a job description, must have five years of experience in uh, performing IT program management. Okay. That is, you either make it, if you got six, or 10, that doesn't matter. You have greater than five, so therefore you're in. If you have three, you don't have five, so you're out. That's considered a selective factor. A, a, a quality ranking factor might be, um, well, we're actually gonna talk about a couple of those, but it might be interpersonal skills, or uh, it might be um, uh, financial management, budget uh, management. Um, so these are come some of those things. Does that, does that help? Thank you. Okay. All right. So on uh, this, we talked of uh, previous slide about both behavioral event. Uh, let me just go back for a second. So we're gonna talk, I'm gonna break these down here into behavioral event interviews and situational interviews. And what you're gonna see is a rating scale uh, for, for both types. Okay, so a rating scale for the behavioral event. So for example, the competency we're looking for, and my little screen's kind of blocking that, but it should say interpersonal skills. And this is how it's defined, okay? So here's the question that could be used in, in this kind of behavioral event interview. Describe a situation in which you had to deal with individuals who were difficult, hostile, or distressed. Who was involved and what specific actions did you take and what was the result? And so this board actually laid out five different level proficiencies levels, which is actually quite a bit, um, five different levels. And then they defined how they would categorize uh, the responses on, on that. And then th this panel actually went as far as laying out specific answers that could be given. So for example, at an intermediate level, you might say, I restored a working relationship between angry coworkers who have opposing views. Uh, for an expert level, it might be present shortcomings of a newly installed HR automation system in a tactful man manner to irate senior management officials. 
So both cases have, have upset customers or upset individuals, but part of it, the difference is, is kind of the scale uh, of those answers. And you can see these definitions here. And, and so this is kind of to show you kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And when you're thinking about your answers, how, how you may be evaluated on that. So, so sometimes it's, it's really hard during the middle of the interview because you're trying to think fast and, and everything else. Um, and that's why the preparation becomes so important because you want to be able, regardless of what type of interview um, a style is being done, you want to be able to really fall up into the highest level uh, of those ratings. Okay, the next one is an example of a situational one. Remember the behavioral one was tell me a time when. The situational ones are, are the hypothetical situations. And this is all tied to the job task. So the job task for this particular job might be to perform investigative work to obtain information and gather evidence or verify facts. And the competency that they're looking for is integrity and honesty. Okay, and you can read the definition down there. So here's the interview question. Uh, you are investigating a group of auto dealership managers suspected of money laundering activities. During the course of an interview with one suspect, the suspect offers to help you buy a car at a price you know is well below market value. What would you do? Um, and, and I do like the unsatisfactory answer is accept the offer. Um, which, which you never know. Uh, but then it also lists the satisfactory and the superior. So only three levels uh, for this kind of rating, uh, for this example of that one. So this is now a hypothetical question that is being presented to you and how it might, um, uh, how, how your answer will be rated. These are much harder to prepare for because you don't have control as the candidate, you don't have control over these types of questions. And, and, for, and they can be tricky because you may not, the, some, in this case, this question is laid out pretty well, but I've also seen questions that are hypothetical question that have been laid out very poorly. And it makes it really difficult for the candidate to answer. So if you are the candidate and you get one of these questions and you don't quite understand um, the question, don't be afraid to ask for, for um, clarification. Um, it, the general point isn't necessarily though to answer the question perfectly. The general uh, point is to kind of assess the type of answer and the, uh, and the type of um, thought that you're giving to this. You know, Mike, this, uh kind of strikes me as this is a, in many ways, an unstructured interview st structure. Um, because oftentimes they'll ask about, you know, like in an interview I was recently on, you know, um, uh, how do you deal with an irate leadership who, you know, and the question was, as opposed to coaching, you should be doing consulting, right? You should yep. put modes, so. Yeah, yeah. It, you're right. It, it, and. You know, so, so, but it's interesting because when we think of structured, we think of very like almost yes, no type answers. And that's not the point of a, a structured interview. You know, the point is actually trying to get the, to be able to do a common um, assessment and rating of the, of the candidate. Okay. All right. So, so we're going to use a job announcement and take, kind of take a look and, and see what we can start pulling out um for this so so there's going to be some acronyms i, I apologize uh this is one that's down at fort leavenworth uh and working for a training adoption command the position is a program analyst uh, particularly it's for the mission command network integration um and this used to be the battle command center as well as the c4 isr if you're familiar with that um so we got the opening dates if you actually want to take a look at this if this job interests you you can apply still today um Let's see, we talked about competitive. So, so the competitive piece is that that's that whole process that we showed in the beginning. Um, one year, one day, it's a term assignment and it's a full-time full -time assignment here, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. So here's the duties. About the position, serves as a senior program analyst engaged in analytical work on Mission Command Center of Excellence's data strategy efforts in support of the Army data plan with a focus on data advocacy, analysis, and integration, okay? The responsibilities. So this next part is the responsibilities. This is where you're gonna start pulling out some of the tasks that you're gonna be responsible for. Conduct analysis, conduct analysis to one, understand operational processes 
and two, determine what data flows are needed, and three, which systems are involved. Determine how to best utilize artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, integrate data steward activities with TRADOC, um, develop and synchronize uh, talent and culture and government and uh, governance and administration. Okay, so there's a lot that you can pull out. So when you're generally doing and looking at applying at jobs, you're trying to pull out of those responsibilities, kind of what are the second and third order tasks in that? What are, are the specified and implied tasks and, and responsibilities that are included in this? And that's how you start to be able to one, tailor your resume, and then two, tailor your interview. So today we're talking about interview. So you're really looking at how to tailor your responses for that interview. Okay. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike, yeah. can I jump in real quick? This is Rebecca. Please. Hey, I just have a question. Well, not, not really a question, more like a comment. So I look a lot, I look at these uh, federal job postings quite a bit, um, especially the ones that deal with either, you know, working with veterans or working for a department that works with veterans or something like that. A lot of times when I read this section on the responsibilities it is so vague it is so incredibly vague and i like just reading it like i i don't even know like if, if i'm getting ready if i'm doing a job search for a veteran and i know what my veterans background is i know what they can do you know i know you know where they worked before what kinds of jobs they've held i know what their skills are but reading stuff like this just makes me want to just scratch my head i'm like i have no idea if the veteran that i'm working with is even qualified for it it's just really confusing to me you, you know ha having written some of these in the past i'm, I'm going to go back up to this first slide for or this first one having when, when you're doing and building a, a job description uh, and a position description and everything, you're, you're kind of working in, in this area. Nick. You, you know, you, you are, as a person who's written this, written these, sometimes you're just pulling up the previous person's work and, and trying to edit it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're written so poorly um, th that you have to throw away everything and start from scratch. Um, and sometimes, honestly, you're not quite sure what you're looking for. And, and so we have a lot of organizations that try to help the hiring manager kind of define that, that position, but, but a lot of times they don't quite get there. Um, and it really depends on the experience level of that HR staff, um, as well as that hiring manager. Uh, and, and so especially on the military side, you got people like green suitors who come in have never done this before and told, hey, you need to write a job description. And they say, oh, okay, let me pull up the last one, which was written poorly, but I don't know any better. So I'm gonna go with that. And so that's where you get problems with that. And then you, as a candidate, you're trying to ask questions to the CPACs or the HR uh, organizations and not getting necessarily good, clear responses. And that's part of the, you know, that's some of the challenges of that. And then the last piece, we talked about that legal defensibility. You're going to get hiring managers that are, are very concerned that if I tell you too many details, I'm giving you an unfair edge. Uh, so, so it's a kind of a goofy system and a process. The one that I showed, this one here, oops, let me go back down there. This one here is actually fairly well written uh, compared, compared to many. Right, but it's just reading it. I, it just, <laughs> it, I can envision getting a lot of a very unqualified candidates just by reading that. Yeah, you, you, it, it is, it's shocking. Um, we would get hundreds of resumes and after you would use that selective criteria or the screening criteria, you'd be down to like five candidates oh, yeah. that would actually make it forward. And, and there's challenges in the, and so, so there's a lot of challenges with this because the person who understands this is somebody already on the inside right, right? yeah yeah it, 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 and the person who understands this the best are, are, is somebody on the inside and that's where if you're interested in these types of positions it's no different than any position outside of the government you need to do some informational interviews mm -hmm. and find out from somebody who who works these types of positions what does this mean I, I think I qualify for this, but what does this mean? Um, so so it, it's the same basic fundamentals of, of um, doing your job search still apply to government jobs. It's just people don't realize that. And, and then that it becomes kind of um, just a, a self-licking ice cream 
where where uh, you know you just get the same candidates kind of going from job to job within the government. Okay. Thank. All right. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yep. yep. Okay. So on this back to this job here, this part is kind of interesting. So they lay out the experiences needed. So you must meet the experience requirements described below. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here, experience refers to paid and unpaid experiences, including volunteer work. So, so people don't think about what they do as far as volunteer work and, and how it can contribute to, to their resume, but it, it can have a huge positive impact. The other thing about volunteer work is if I'm missing certain uh, knowledge, skills, and attributes, or particularly in the knowledge and skills for, say, I need to do web design, but I've never done this before. A great way to do this is in a volunteer fashion, where you're maybe you're helping out with the church webpage, or maybe you're doing some or some nonprofit uh, volunteer work. You're gonna there's a lot of benefits to this. One, you're volunteering and helping generally good causes. Two, you're getting experience, and three, most volunteers don't get fired unless you're doing something ethical, uh, unethical. Um, so so it's a great way to start dipping your foot or your toe into the water of some of these areas to decide, is this something I wanna do? And if it is, can this help get me kind of experience on the resumes? So don't ignore your volunteer work. Um, you can volunteer for things like the Eagle Group. Great volunteer experience. Um, okay, so now it talks about specialized experience. This comes back into some, some of the, the um, selective criteria. One year of special, it's one year specialized experience equivalent to the GS-12 grade level in the federal service, which includes, and then it kind of defines that, okay? And now it talks, so th that's kind of like the, the cut line, those, those requirements. Then it says, you will be evaluated on the basis of your level of competency in the following areas, network management, planning and evaluating, and project management. So right there, this one's telling you, this, this is actually pretty good. This, they're telling you what they're gonna be interviewing you on. They're telling you what they're looking for in the resume on top of, you know, you need to make it through this cut line, but really what we're really particularly looking for and are gonna be evaluating you, uh, it will be on these areas. So how are they gonna evaluate you? Well, they even have that, how you will be evaluated. Okay, um, so the, you'll be evaluated on how well you meet the qualifications above. And, and then it talks about if you don't quite meet them, if you are minimally qualified, your resume and supporting documents will be prepared to your responses to the assessment questionnaire. So, so for those of you that have applied to a government job, they also do the assessment questionnaire and it gets really tricky. And, and the assessment questionnaire, because that's, that's you, your self-assessment, not anybody else's if, assessment on how well, whether you're an expert, whether, whether you're a novice, whether you're, you're average on these certain uh, skills, you're responding to that within the assessment questionnaire. Um, it, it gets, it, it's, a, it's really tricky because with the assessment questionnaire, if you're not at a certain level, you can be eliminated from the job. But at the same time, they have this, this statement here, if after reviewing your resume and supporting documentation, a determination is made that you have inflated your qualifications, you may lose consideration for this position. So, so this whole assessment questionnaire is, is a, a very, very touchy and it's been a bit controversial um, a piece of the federal hiring process. I'd love to see them kind of get rid of that, uh, but it's still there. All right, so, so that's how you would start pulling out and identifying what I need to prepare for. So, so then as far as general tips, so we talked about the first one, understand the quality ranking factors, understand how you are going to be rated or at least what you're gonna be rated on. You won't be able to know how you're gonna be rated exactly, but you will at least know the, pro to the topics. So in that previous case, it was things like projects, it was things like, um, uh, planning and evaluation, project management, network management. You know that you're gonna have to be prepared to talk about that. And, and you may have to be, do some research and, and brush up on some things, okay? So research, so things, you can research a lot of different areas. You can research open source. So there's something called the early bird, which is a con, uh, uh, account, con, it's all the big headlines of the day uh, that are rated uh, around the army or they're around the military that is uh, sent out to people. You can subscribe to that and that kind of gets you some knowledge. Informational interviews we talked about. If I'm applying for a job at, at uh, the Mission Command Center of Excellence, I'm gonna go reach out to my friends at the Mission Command Excellence or at a different center of excellence 
and uh, be asking these questions. What do you know about these types of positions? You know, what's the big, you know, burner right now that's going on? Um, and that helps you prepare relevant examples. So, so you're, st you're still trying to tell a story. Um, you still are gonna get some of the basic questions. You're gonna get some knowledge questions, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. But you want to be prepared for stories and examples and then be able to work those stories into the interview question as much as you can. Um, please know your own resume. Um, you would be surprised by the number of people who walk in there and when they get a question about their resume, they actually can't really answer it. So please be know your resume, be able to talk about it. You didn't see that in the examples I gave, but some of those still uh, come through. All right, we talked about the, the active, the service members as interviewers. A lot of these service members will have very limited experience doing these types of things. And when they have limited experiences, sometimes they lean on knowledge over attributes. Okay, and I've seen this uh, several times with instead of the, in, the interview becoming really to try to understand uh, the, the candidate, it becomes really kind of almost a quiz. Tell me, tell me, what does this acronym mean? Or tell me, what does that acronym mean? And that can work, be kind of interpreted one of two different ways. One, it's, it might feel like a gotcha or two, they're trying to understand how much you actually know about this industry that you can apply immediately. OK, and that goes to the next one. Understand, I put uh, understand training up timeline, but really understand the timeline where you're going to have to be utilized. If they have time to train you up, then that you can go with a more, less experienced candidate. But if there's something hot going on right now, if General Smith wants wants this um, requirement document developed or this program managed immediately because it's falling on its face or they or it's a high priority, then, then you're going to have to understand those acronyms and they don't have as much time to teach, teach you. So, so this is, goes back to where that research comes, becomes uh, important. So, so one thing, the second from last bullet is actually really, really key, it is we talked about the structured interview and we talked about how every interviewer has to ask the same questions, but they have to ask the same initial questions. OK, they can do follow up questions based off of your responses. And because and because everybody's responses are different, those follow up questions will be different. And, and one thing, one way that you want to be able to pull that interview panel in, you know, into uh, um, you and get interested in you is, is by getting them to ask questions, not because you answered them poorly, but because that you have a story to tell that is very, very relevant. So you answer their questions and you, you tell, lay out that story and then it, it invites certain follow-ups on, on there. And so the more you can kind of kind of reel them in and get them interested in you, uh, the stronger your uh, overall performance in that interview was, will be. And then the last piece is rehearse. Just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Rehearse with somebody other than yourself. You know, rehearse, get somebody who knows this, get somebody who doesn't know this, but just practice. You know, um, normally, even in a structured interview, you interview, you will still have the, the common, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, that should be, you should be able to rattle that off without being robotic, um, but still nevertheless, you should be able to really rattle that off. Um, okay. So be well, rehearsed without being rehearsed. Yes. <laughs> Hey, Greg's got a question, I think. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Okay, Mike, a couple questions here. Um, so the first one is, I think when you have a job description, a good thing to do is when you have to spend some quality time analyzing the job description, and you need to prepare what I call a you need I have matrix. So basically with a matrix, you're gonna put those job elements on one side. On the other side, you're going to um, put all of your experience that relates to that, that touches, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correlation with that item. Now, if you have, uh, so that's a good thing to study. So when questions come up about your experience, you've already kind of addressed that. The other thing is, here's a, here's a, a problem. And the problem is, as you know, a lot of these, they say, okay, uh, it's a GS-13, you must have one year of experience at the GS-12 level or equivalent. Okay, what is that saying? The ideal person for that job is the GS-12. Who's done that? Okay, that's who you're competing against. 
So if you if you can find a if you if you're lucky enough to get a maybe a posting for that GS12 job, you know that'd be great. But one of the things I ran into, I applied for, with making a really long story short, I applied for a government job, and um, the the GSA point of contact agreed I was 100% qualified for it, but I was, but I could not have been, could not be selected. You know why? Because there is a, for all the GS grades, there's a military equivalent. Okay, and. The first round, they said, well, we didn't, you know, uh, you didn't pass because you needed to put your military grade um, in, um, uh, associate your military grade with the experience, um, your experience bullets. Okay. Okay. All right. And I think like, um, I think like a, like, like a major, like an O O4 is equivalent to I think that's equivalent to a 13 and, and there's a little bit of play there. And although the uh, OPM agreed I was, that I was qualified, I did have the right experience. The corresponding officer grade where they had the experience was one level below. In other words, I had to ex join the Navy and get experience early. I had that, I had all the experience. There was no question about that, but because the grade I, I had it at a just a ju more junior grade than the GS level. Then they said, sorry, we can't put you forward. Okay. So what did I do? I sent my resume to the hiring manager and they flew me in for an interview. So I, I went around um, OPM and got the interview. So I guess that's something to be aware of. Um, so if it says equivalent to that GS-12 level, any, any intel you can get about what that GS-12 level is will help you. Um, that's what you need really when you're doing that, um, you, that you need I have when you're looking at your experience. Does your experience correlate to that GS-13 level? Um, if it correlates to the GS-12 level, I think that, that, that may be even more helpful. What do you think? You know, you, you hit on one of the one of the big challenges you see with the 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 GS system, which it becomes so focused on. You get so many internal candidates. Uh, uh, there, there's a huge advantage if you for internal candidates, and, and it's very rank focused. Um, yes. So we're talking GS 12s. We're talking you know which cat which is about equivalent to a captain. Um, yeah. You know, Greg, you did the right thing by kind of working around the system. You know, the other way is to highlight, look, yes, my military rank was this, but let me tell you why I'm a GS-12 equivalent in this area. And you highlight those experiences, but it's, it's going to be dependent on in those cases where you can't get directly to the hiring manager or you don't know who the hiring manager is then it becomes to really, really, now it comes the interpersonal skills of working with uh, those HR personnel to be able to kind of get through that system. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm not going to lie, you, you know, it, it can be a very, very frustrating uh, a system to work with. Um, but as the candidate, especially if you think I'm a good fit, you know, it's a different thing if you're not really a good fit and you know you're not a really good fit and you're trying to <laughs> kind of right. smoke your way through. But if you know that you have the ability, you can perform at this level and you have performed at this level, you know, it's important that you do kind of push that in there. Um, and that's kind of what was the yeah. thought of that assessment questionnaire was to say, well, look, if you think you're an expert, yeah. you know, even though you might not have the military rank, you know, here's a chance for you to get there, get in. Um, the problem is that yeah. everybody says they're experts. And so if you don't say you're expert, you're, you you probably won't get it. You know, that that's kind of the challenge. It, it's a, a very, very imperfect system. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so the last thing is, let's see if this pops back up. Um, as far as references that I used to put together, I, I will post these slides when I post the video as well. Uh, but I use these as my two primary re references for that. So, it, and these are focused particularly for the people putting together the interview. Or, uh, interview. But, but if it's one thing, you know, we always talk about put yourself in the interviewer's uh, seat 
you know, this is a way to start doing that and taking a look at what is the system that they have to work within. And so I can understand it better as a candidate. The more, this, the nice thing about the, the federal government though, is that it's fairly transparent. You, you wanna know how an interview works? Here's the guide, here's the other guide. You, you know, that's what they're going to be doing. Um, so that's a, an advantage. Okay, uh, so, so that concludes the formal part of my uh, presentation. Well, what are your questions? <laughs>